welcome to the first session of the six educational webinars that will take place across the course of today to form the Global Mental Health Action Network annual event. My name is Enoch Lee and I'm calling in from Beijing, China today. Now my work connected with mental health is very much focused at work and to systemically change the workplaces so we do not put our mental health at risk. And how I'm connected to this part of the network is because I'm also the board member for United for Global Mental Health, which acts as the Secretariat for Global Mental Health Action Network, your host for today's series of webinars. Now today really allows members of this network to come together and spend more focused time hearing from different experts and asking them questions on topics that are crucial to making progress within the global and national mental health landscapes. It's also a space where we can learn from each other and share our experiences. The Global Mental Health Action Network is now a cross-sector community of 1,900 members who share a common goal to increase political and financial support for mental health across the world. And if you're not already signed up as a member, we will be sharing that information on how to join the network in the chat function today. As a very first session, we are thinking about how we can work with the World Health Organization to achieve the changes that we want to see in the community and sectors around us. I'm sure every one of you on this session know that the WHO launched the World Mental Health Report last Friday. Now, some of the things that I took away from that webinar and listening to a lot of distinguished speakers around the world is there is a lot to be done. We have made a lot of progress and yet there is still more that we can improve on. And we definitely need to reshape the environment that influence mental health. And the most important thing is it can be done. During the webinar, we heard of cases from Botswana, from Argentina, from New Zealand, to say the least. And one thing that really stuck in my mind is there is no vaccine for mental health, as one of our speakers say. And so we need to do our very best so that people know about it, they're aware of it, and that they can access the care that they need at a time that they need, not to mention making sure that these support structures are in place. And so when we think about the time to act and to make these changes, we start to think about how. How do we make these changes come to fruition? And exactly is what we're gonna be discussing on today's webinar. We will hear more in a while on today's discussions on some of the key learnings from this report and also whether we come from the private sector, international organizations, national organizations, or the civil society, we'll be learning from some of our speakers today on how we can use this report and some of the recommendations in it to mobilize the transformation that we would like to see for mental health. And I encourage all of you um, from wherever you are to engage with us in the chat function. If you have any questions, any comments, feel free to put them in into the chat. We will have some time for Q&A at the end and I will try to keep an eye on it as well. Now, before we start into the discussion, I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. And maybe I'll start just clockwise from my screen. Um, I start with Raj. If you would like to say a few words about yourself and what you do, please. Oh, <clears throat> thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Raj and I'm the director of Mariwala Health Initiative, which is an organization based in India that does advocacy, grant making and capacity building in mental health with a focus on making mental health accessible for marginalized communities. Um, we run about 37 projects all over India currently. So that's it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Raj. Lovely to have you. Christina, would you like to say a few words about your work at MSF? Yeah, hello. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, I am Cristina Carreño. I am mental health advisor in MSF, Doctors Without Borders. As uh, probably many of you know, we are a medical humanitarian organization working in more than 50 countries for more than 50 years. And we are really committed to to promote also the inclusion of, of uh, MSPSS, mental health and psychosocial support in, uh, in emergencies. So let's continue later. Thank you, Christina. And Raj, you're joining us from Afghanistan today. Would you like to say, sorry, Ahmad, sorry. You're joining us from Afghanistan today. Would you like to say a few words about the work you do? 
Yes, thank you so much. My name is Ahmad Nassar and I'm founder of uh, Literacy Center, which is focused on educating about mental health and also intersecting the, intersecting the benefits of mental health and alleviating literacy. Um, as a mental health activist, my advocacy journey circles around being a global youth reporter, being a fellow, uh, alumni fellow for the Origin Advocacy Fellowship, Young Leader for Women Deliver, and Expert Reviewer for World Economic Forum. Um, I'm so happy and glad to be part of this webinar, and I hope that I can contribute to it. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, I'm seeing, I think, Angie, you're, you're also with us, but we can't see you yet at the moment. Is that correct? But can you hear us? Maybe we'll come back to Angie once we have the tech figured out. Um, Devorah, would you like to introduce yourself and the work you do at the WHO? Sure, I'm uh, Devorah Kestel. I'm the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use. And the work I do is I have a lot of meetings. I write and read a lot of emails. And uh, uh, beyond that, we are uh, supporting uh, countries, member states of the World Health Organization in uh, advancing uh, these uh, agendas that have to deal with mental health, with brain health, and with substance use. Thank you, Devora. We also have on our panel Angie Tarr, who is the director of the Mental Health Unit of the Government of Liberia. I know she can hear us. Um, we can't really hear her yet, but I'm sure we will figure out the tech where we hear her. And Angie has a lot of experience in the nursing, nursing industry and in the leadership of that part of the government and in the Liberian Board of Nurse, Nursing and Midwifery. So I hope we get the chance to hear more about her work here. Now, welcome to everybody again. Um, as we're joining, I see people from all over the world. I'd like to start off this discussion with inviting Devorah to say a few things about the World Mental Health Report and some of the key messages that you would like us to take home with us. Over to you, Devorah. Thank you so much, uh, Nerko, with the uh, uh, muting and unmuting, uh, struggling a bit. Thank you so much. So, um, and, and thank you uh, to, the, to the colleagues for this uh, opportunity to, to bring this uh, um, snapshot of uh, the World Mental Health Report, Transforming Mental Health for All. We, we have put together in this report, um, on one hand, uh, an updated uh, and um, comprehensive uh, review of uh, available data on mental health related issues. And we uh, analyze the different uh, areas or components that are related to mental health, whether it is uh, determinants of mental health or, or, or issues that have impacted uh, significantly mental health, uh, uh, like uh, COVID-19, uh, issues of human uh, rights and human rights violations, but also what, what are those rights that we should protect and promote, and, and uh, stigma, but then also promotion, prevention, and treatment, and, and recovery. So uh, we try to be as comprehensive as possible, but if we focus on the take-home message, we have to uh, summarize them around the uh, three paths for transformation. And the first one is the need to uh, deepen uh, value and commitment. We believe that mental health must be uh, valued as an integral part of health and, and well being, but also as a human right, as mentioned, mentioned uh, uh, before, uh, health is a basic human right, mental health is part of it. And it has to be also considered as a component of public health approaches, social well-being, and a sustainable development. So uh, by we understand that by giving this value to mental health, then commitment and investment by all relevant stakeholders will come uh, as, a, as, a, as a consequence, also as a next step. And so we, we are uh, uh, should promoting the, 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 or, or highlighting the need to take care of our own mental health on one hand, but also then uh, on um, in supporting people with uh, um, mental health conditions and ensuring the inclusion of um, people with conditions in every step of the um, uh, mental health system decision 
processes and uh, then uh, the investment, as I was saying, by all stakeholders in terms of uh, human resources as well as financial resources. Then we go to a second path for transformation and that is the need to change, to reshape environments and concretely it's about protect our mental health and prevent mental health conditions. Uh, and then uh, uh, um, for people with mental health conditions is an opportunity to play a role as everybody else in the community that uh, where, where they are. And it, it is also about the need to, to understand the social and structural determinants of mental health and intervene to reduce risks whenever possible, to build resilience and to limit uh, barriers for uh, people with uh, mental health conditions, but also uh, means uh, having adequate uh, policies uh, at every level as needed. We um, uh, consider that it is important, the role of the individual in this uh, process, but it is not just the individual that has to make it all. Policies should be in place and all stakeholders should uh, play a role, as I was saying. We need to also uh, promotes then interventions in different spaces um, beyond the, the, the individual work that are, uh, for example, home uh, when preventing violence uh, against women and children will have, of course, an impact on the on the development of mental health for children and, and for everybody else in in, the, in that context. Are also. Um, uh, interventions in school uh, to prevent bullying, for example, or in the workplace, but also at the community level. And um, health care services have also a big role to play where the, the um, attitudes towards people with mental health conditions needs to change to promote <clears throat> better health care for uh, people with mental health conditions, but also eliminate any form of human rights violations and, and promote inclusion of uh, people with health conditions, mental health conditions. And then the nature, of course, uh, with the importance of green spaces and the impact of climate change and mental health. So all this is what we have uh, grouped around the, the concept of uh, reshaping reshaping uh, environments. And the third um, path for transformation then uh, is the one of uh, mental health care and the need to strengthen mental health care. We, we need to change where, how, and by whom mental health care is offered. We need to, to reorganize uh, mental health services. And, and on one hand, we, we promote uh, care, uh, mental health care, um, uh, be moved away from custodial care in psychiatric hospitals to, to community-based mental health services. And uh, you can find in the report a very detailed uh, description of a, 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 a pretty exhaustive variety of um, mental health, community-based mental health services that countries have developed according to their context, uh, possibilities, uh, uh, resources available, etc. And then on the other hand, uh, um, services and programs for people with mental health conditions should be complemented with services and programs for uh, uh, common conditions, not only the severe, but also common. And, and uh, there are out there a number of tools and resources that should be really made available uh, more uh, uh, massively, perhaps. Uh, sorry, that was my, my computer. Uh, we described then in the report also a network of mental health services that should be established um, not only as specialized mental health services, but are incorporated in the health sector and mental health should be part of the health sector and a person should be, um, the attention should be given to mental health when somebody uh, approaches a health uh, professional for any other physical condition. There may be issues of comorbidity or mental health challenges across the life course. And so children, adolescents, older adults, as well as, as I said, other diseases or conditions such as HIV or TB or, or, or diabetes or etc. Um, so this this uh, mental health not being isolated but be part being part of the health service and offered at primary health care level. That is um, really a, 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 a very important component. And the last the, the third piece of this uh, network of 
of mental health care should be outside of the health sector, education, housing, um, justice, of course, other sectors that should incorporate mental health uh, as part of their uh, areas of responsibility when dealing with people uh, at any at any level. So we believe then that by uh, promoting these three uh, paths for transformation and taking concrete action in each one of them at the level that campus are uh, able to and, and with a plan that will suit the needs of that specific country, then we believe that mental health will be accessible and affordable uh, for all. Um, I will stop here because I don't know, I didn't check my timing and I don't want to be to say too much more at, in this first round. So over to you, Anesh. Thank you. Thank you, Devora. Thank you for giving us a snapshot of this very comprehensive World Mental Health Report. And indeed, it's not just my comment. We can see in the chat that some of the comments coming in saying that, um, for example, Sue was saying she really liked on page 254 the infographic on all the key shifts that we need to do across the sectors that you have all you have mentioned as well. And so one of the points that you mentioned, you know, in reshaping our environment, obviously the environment, the context we work in is extremely important on how we implement some of these recommendations. So I'd like to turn this first question to Christina. Um, your, your context, your environment is emergency settings. And so what are some of the important messages for you in this report for people working in emergency settings? Yeah, indeed. We work mainly in emergencies. Well, first, uh, we would like to I would like to congratulate Deborah and all the WHO team for this uh, really comprehensive report. So we think that this is going to be a very helpful tool eh, for uh, for us and to really push for MSPSS to be properly integrated. Uh, so there are a lot of key messages. I would like to highlight some of them. The first one, of course, is that everyone has a right to mental health. Uh, that the people with lived experience are crucial stakeholders in mental health. I think this message is highlighted several times that uh, there is a promotion of, uh, of a right-based, person-centered recovery approach that we think also it's, it's crucial. Uh, MSF is committed also to the Quality Rights Initiative, and we think this is something that we need to continue working on. Uh, in uh, humanitarian and public emergencies, in particular, represents an obligation and opportunity for countries to invest in mental health. This is a, a statement that it's also in, in the reports and we think that this is uh, something we witness a lot. Uh, and and uh, COVID has been an example of a public health emergency, emergency, but in general, this is something that is an opportunity and it's also the right moment to, to, to push also no? for, for, for uh, improving the mental health. Um, the mental health needs, as you all know, increase in humanitarian emergencies, and this is also documented in the report. One in five people living in settings affected by conflicts, uh, in the preceding 10 years is estimated to have a mental disorder. The people with severe mental health conditions are extremely vulnerable during and after emergencies. Uh, some of the mental health conditions are uh, more prevalent in refugees than among host populations. And the importance of frontline responders and relief workers also, that they are high, higher risk of uh, having mental health problems and um, uh, that MHPSS, this is crucial, it should be integrated from the preparedness, no? not, not only once the emergency is there, but also since the preparedness plans, the response and the recovery phase. Um, I would highlight also, I think it's very important, all the parts of the of the gaps. No? Uh, there are several gaps mentioned, I think most of the, the most important ones, and I would like to, to highlight the scarce workforce for mental health, that this is a problem we face uh, uh, a lot, no? so, so how we should promote the, the competencies of the staff that is already working mainly in, in the healthcare where we work, in primary healthcare, but also at the community level. And then the lack of essential medicines, this is a key barrier uh, to quality care in uh, several in several uh, countries and there are big inequalities uh, in the listing availability, pricing and affordability for essential psychotropic. Uh, there is lack of data, also the health seeking behavior from the population no? that sometimes is 
it's very challenging. So even if you have uh, services available and quality services, that this is not common, but even though it's not enough. No? So also there is a lot to do with the communities, to work with them, to, to do awareness with them and to, to, to highlight the importance of mental health and what is mental health. Huh? And of course, the integration of mental health in general health services, uh, that is a crucial ingredient for the mental health reform, the building capacity of the general health health staff in primary care settings and adding non-specialists of mental health staff and the, all the community mental health services. Um, so, oh, and of course, this is stop gradually, no? the, the work at the level of the, the resources at the level of the psychiatric hospitals. I think that the examples and the infographics really are very useful uh, because the, it shows no, how things and alternatives are there already, you know, that there are a lot of countries and a lot of organizations that has tried to have tried to do to find alternatives to 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 all the challenges that are common to most of the people. And, and I think that they can be very useful eh, for other people to get inspired. Um, and I would say that also the tools and resources you know, to finish in this first round. I think that's all the references to tools and resources that are already available there is also a good way to have all them compiled in the report. I think it's a good way to promote uh, the, the, a wider use of, of, all this, of all these documents. Yeah, over Thank to you, you, Christina. Thank you. How about for you, Raj, in your work for transformation of mental health in India, what does the report say that is important for you and your setting? Thanks, Enoch, and congratulations on the report. It's very exciting. And I'm going to pick on <clears throat> a line that Devara said about reshaping uh, the physical, social, and economic characteristics of environments. Now, this is important for us in advocacy because, uh, and this is something that we've been saying for a long time, we cannot sidestep the need to address social, economic, and institutional exclusion that contributes to psychosocial distress. And I'll take one example, that of mental health at work. Uh, this line from the WHO report and further details in the report actually allows us to question the very um, narrow biomedical discourse that currently exists on mental health at work which is framed as either loss of productivity or it's linked to very particular illnesses such as depression. And you know, in the end, it leads to a very piecemeal tokenistic solution, such as an awareness program or at best employee assistance programs. Now, I think the other critical difference that the WHO report mentions is that it sees a role for both government and employers. Now, this allows us to advocate for workplace mental health as a structural issue which means that measures need to be taken overall at the ecosystem level by the government, but also by sectors and of course, individual organizations. So it allows us to look at workplace mental health as not just mental health policies or counselors at workplaces, but excessive job demands, job insecurity, conflict with supervisors and a lack of social safety nets. So if we are to advocate for this, using the WHO report, we, we, have, we should be able to say that government needs to bolster both social assistance measures such as employment programs or social pro protection programs that provide safety nets in case of health related issues, accidental injuries at work or unemployment. And of course, related to this, both government and business need to bear upon insurance providers to include mental health coverage as part of their health insurance. Now, making steps towards the parity of physical health entitlements and mental health entitlements is absolutely critical uh, in advocacy in India and is the responsibility of both state and business, as WHO has said. Um, and I think also for us as being in mental health, I think this underlines the importance and legitimacy and validity of unions and how unions are important in identifying, in advocating for, in addressing unique stressors at workplaces. So it's critical that this collective action be honored by law, be supported by those of us in mental health if we are to have just and equitable and mentally healthy workplaces. I'll also want to give an example of 
uh, the WHO report talking about the governance gap. Now, I think this is critical because the report actually lays out that quite a few countries have laws and mental health plans in place, uh, but just having the plan in place is not enough. Uh, the WHO report does raise the importance of full implementation and resourcing for such plans, um, which is very critical for us in India because we have a progressive mental health care act in place, the Mental Health Care Act of 2017, and it's been in place since, uh, since then, but there has been I think lackadaisical implementation, there isn't enough monitoring as well, uh, which is also pointed out in the WHO report. And so I think there are quite a few points in this report that are rallying calls. Much remains to be done, and we must raise the political will to bridge the care gap by implementing the Mental Health Care Act. And things are being done. We have an app, for example, that we've launched on the Mental Health Care Act, but the government really needs to step up resource it fully, implement it, and as the WHO report says, put in place targets and indicators to monitor that progress. Thanks so much. Thank you, Raj. I can uh, I say I would agree with everything you have said, and I would dub the whole thing for China as well. Um, hardware, software in place, let's get, get the gears in motion. Um, how about for you, Ahmad, in, um, in Afghanistan? You know, what, what is important for you, for your work, to advocate for transformation there? Um, thank you so much for your question. Um, surviving in a conflict zone, uh, the most pivotal revealing for me are the impediments that a crisis poses on our mental health. So citing this from the report that it's estimated that one in five people in conflict zones live with a mental condition. And a vivid example is the distasteful bereavement that tons of families are enduring because of the recent bomb attack on religious minorities in Afghanistan. As the report states, such detrimental occurrences not only create grievance, but also stems hatred and long-term mental illnesses for the vulnerable ones. The complications, however, are doubled within the cross-sections of wealth and marginalization based on our social status. And the irritating statistic that reveals a 29% difference between implementation plans in low income and higher income groups is an unsurprising example of the existing gap between accessibility and affordability. Another challenge in my context is the low literacy we possess on this crucial topic to a point that it's considered too negligible or stigmatizing to be resolved by some. Such instances urge us to reframe our vision for the future of mental health while taking equality and inclusion in mind. Particularly, my advocacy work foregrounds social emotional learning and community-based intervention as the foundation for change. Primarily, this is to alleviate the exhausting pressures that adolescents face as they identify their roles. And secondly, to direct their untapped potentials into a catalyst for change rather than reinforcing risky behavior problems. On the other hand, for collectivist South Asian cultures, the community plays a central role around decision-making and burden sharing. So even superficially educating our communities can go a long way into improving mental health of an individual. Under conditions where schools are banned for girls in Afghanistan, or a child can't attend school due to labor, their strongest support system comes from their surrounding communities. But let's think for a second that when their families say that you should go, you should get married instead of going to school, how will their mental health get impacted in this regard? So therefore, community-based interventions must be highly centralized in such contexts. These overlaps noticeably address the possibility of integrating affordable and responsive mechanisms in any context, given that we utilize a context-based approach. Presently, we acknowledge that mental health is linked with each of the SDGs, and it's gladdening to observe how a topic that's been long closeted is obtaining the visibility that it deserves. But our mental health shouldn't be thought of as a clinical condition only. Instead, its vitality should be strongly stretched in schools, workplaces, homes, and beyond, because it's time for innovation, it's time for candor, and it's time 
for apprehension of our demands. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, thank you for inspiring us. And I hope others follow your lead as well in some of the work that you're doing. I'd like to direct this next question to Angie. And thank you for joining us today. I know we had a bit of a tech problem, but glad to see you now on screen. Um, Angie, if you could um, say a bit about your work with the government at the government level and also how your colleagues work with WHO. And if you don't mind, I'll actually bundle the two questions together for you because you can transition us as well about thinking of how do we use this report and how do you advise other national governments to use this WHO report to achieve the transformation as well? Angie, please. Okay, thank you. I am, I'm sorry that I had this problem from the beginning. Am I Oliver? Yes. Okay, so how I have my, my colleagues and the other partners have been working with the issue? That's a very good question. Um, mental health stakeholders in Liberia, including land ministries, partners such as the Carter Center Mental Health Program, partners in health, Medicine San Frontiers, uh, Cultivation for Users Hope, which is the only uh, organization for persons with lived experience, and many other organizations that we cannot name all. We, are, we have all worked collaboratively with the WHO on mental, neurological, and substance use disorder. And from the beginning in 2014, at the break of uh, coronavirus, WHO seconded a technical assistant to the Ministry of Health to the Department of Mental Health, which makes it very easy for us in terms of collaboration. And that person is, is sits at the national level uh, uh, on the technical coordination committee that is established to advise the Minister of Health when it comes to mental health uh, conditions in country. So the WHO have provided so much support when it comes to technical and financial support, uh, even with response from the Ebola to the coronavirus, they have supported it. Uh, MHPSS response team to develop documents that the SOP protocols, uh, training guidelines, and those guidelines have been used to train uh, MHPSS responders that we deploy in other areas. Um, so with the issue support to the Ministry of Health, it has been so encouraging. We were able to um, adapt the MH gap into the librarian contest, and that was used to train primary healthcare workers just to increase our uh, integration of mental health into primary health care area. So um, there are so much that have been done with that, uh, the issue support with the person that has been assigned with us at the Ministry of Health. So uh, in 2016, uh, WHO supported the government to revise the mental health policy. That was the second revision, uh, the first re re revision of the mental health policy from 2016 to 2021. And that was solely done with the issue of support when it comes to technical and financial support. And that document has been expired. And we are on a present revision of the, the second one, which is 2022 for the next five years. So there are so much have been done when it comes to the collaboration with partners along with the issue work in Liberia. And looking at substance use disorders, uh, there are so many partners in, in, in Liberia that are implementing uh, substance use disorder, addiction, prevention, and all of those. But these are doc, uh, interventions that we realized at the government level that it was the quality of the intervention, um, the, is it FNA based and how is it provided? So with that, with the coordination with WHO, we were able to uh, conduct a survey to understand the accessibility, um, the the affordability and the quality. So that survey result was used in a few years back that we were able to train addition professionals in country. So these are all support from the government, um, from the from every issue end of um, point of view. And also mm -hmm. with the same substance use, we were able to get a support from the issue to come up with a national uh, protocol for substance use disorder. So all of these documents are available and it's not going to be used by uh, the ministry alone, but partners in country. So these are resources that we can make use of to, to, to improve mental health and sustain use disorder or services in country. Yeah, so looking at how the government can uh, use uh, achieve transformation in mental health, I guess that was the second question. And so, yeah, so in an effort to do this, uh, the, uh, the government, of like, we must be able to do a lot of things. 
we should the government should be able to support fully support mental health and implement mental health policy. As one of the speakers said, half the document is not just enough, but how can we implement it to the fullest? How can we have others involved to join us? Like the 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 um the report that was launched last Friday, one of the key things was that how can we have others joining us that are not in the health sector and not just the health, uh, we as health professionals, but how? So government should be able to increase domestic funding for mental health. Like in 2019, uh, before 2019, mental health partners in country with the uh, organization with lived experience advocated at the House of Parliament over years, but at least we were up to in 2019, there was a budget that was allocated, a budget line was created within the Ministry of Health budget line, and they were able to allocate 25,000 United States dollars for mental health for the Republic of Liberia. That was a start and it was a big uh, uh, boost for us because it was never available. And from that time, the second, the second, it was augmented to 50,000 Liberian uh, United States dollars. That's where we are now for Liberia when it comes to right. budget from, from, from the government. So yes, it's, it's little, but at least there's a budget now within the Ministry of Health budget that we can count on. So we need, we need to have more advocacy, have all us joining us to see how government can increase domestic funding, not just depending on donors or international partners. We also want the government to prioritize mental health as they prioritize other uh, programs like NTDs, um, malaria control programs, uh, family health program. Mental health should be prioritized. They should speak mental health wherever they whatever conferences they attend, whatever gallery. So these are things that we want government to do. To also, yeah. the, prov the provision of evidence-based holistic mental health services is key. As the speaker, uh, one of the speakers from last Friday said that we should include young people mental health services. We should look at the aspect of school mental health, even community mental health, not just having an institution. So these are yeah. things that we, we need others in Liberia to join the government or to join and the Ministry of Health to see how we can press on government or do I'm government, but we need others. And Debbie H has actually been on the standby and they have really supported us when it comes to uh, having the mental health law passed because they, they were part of the delegate that went to the House of Parliament to defend why is the mental health need a law because it was a serious mm. argument. Yeah, the, the government, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yeah. I, I wanted to jump in here because I, I hear you say some very important things, especially how we can partner with the WHO at a national level as well. You know, use their document, implement some of the recommendations, and they are there to support, you know, when we are thinking about financial policy guidance and all of that. But I wanted to jump in and pick up because you did give an example on youth, and I want to turn to Atmat here because as youth advocates using this report, you know, what is your advice? Um, how can other youth advocates use this with the support of WHO to advance action on mental health? Can I turn to you here, Atmat? Yes, thank you again for your question. Um, mm. I think actions can take a variety of forms and it doesn't specifically have to come from advocates, but in our own individual capacities, we can all move the needle for mental health. Mm. Uh, by and large, uh, the World Health Organization report comprehensively taps into the social and economic values of investing in mental health. So your advocates can use the report to generate an action plan as an advocacy tool to lobby their governments for catalyzing change. However, um, the report lists the challenge we face internationally and, and based on our respective contexts, our priorities might differ. Uh, for instance, in Afghanistan, there aren't official reports to state the number of people with a mental disorder, while in Pakistan, even though research exists, services are insufficiently integrated to treat patients. Uh, therefore, country-level consultations must engage the relevant stakeholders to identify our shortfalls and decide on the next steps. Mm. In the world today, 71% of people with psychosis don't receive mental health services and only 2% of the budget is allocated for its treatment. Therefore, it calls for an encompassing approach to end the vicious cycle of deprivation from our rights. Yeah. With novel innovations like task shifting, digital technologies and usage of sports to name a few, 
we comprehend that interventions can affordably advance mental well-being outside clinical settings. Furthermore, the technical and financial support that the World Health Organization is providing opens doors of opportunities for us to review our policies, reshape our plans, and reflect on the pros and cons of our advocacy journey. From increasing budget allocation to improving service coverage and to decriminalizing mental conditions, a plethora of areas desperately demands investment and advocates can use their laudable skills to change the scenario. Additionally, there are tons of- Sorry. Okay, so additionally, there are tons of success stories and case studies that can educate us from the experience that's been gained in the past. So there's a possibility of duplicating it in our relevant contexts. Based on the report findings, even families and friends can act as a protective factor for resilience through peer support or informal care given. So we see the transformation simply starts from ourselves and all of us can push the narrative for mental health. My last advice for all advocates is to embrace their potential, be proud of their dedication, and don't wait a second to confidently walk in this amazing journey for the world and for yourself. Thank you. Very well said. Indeed, there is no reason to keep waiting. Um, and Christina, for you, in the emergency settings, how do you advise the different actors to use this report in their advocacy and care work? Well, uh, I think that there are some of the key messages that uh, Angie from, from uh, Liberia already mentioned. I think it's super important and it's highlighted in the report, investment and prioritization. And mm -hmm. these are some of the challenges that, uh, that we face. No? This, it can be used internally in each of our organizations, but also with donors, with governments. We need to really use this information uh, to promote also, um, you know, like why they need to invest more. No? So that there is, a, we, we talk about these two percent uh, of the health care budget that is allocated to mental health. This is not enough, and we agree with that. But I think it's very important to use this report to show the magnitude of the problem, the prevalences, the treatment gap, that it reached more than 80% uh, in, in the low and middle income countries, in a lot of them, and the consequences of not treating uh, the mental health problems and disorder, because sometimes the message that we get is, okay, there are not so many people, they are not so visible. No? We know it's, yeah. a, it's an invisible, uh, problem and disease, usually the mental health conditions. So, so it's very important to show what are the consequences at a health uh, level, no? what are the risks, no? the premature mortality is here, mm. the comorbidities, uh, but also the disability, of course, no? the years live with disability, the suicide, uh, but of course the economic consequences of the mental health conditions at the level of productivity, um, I found particularly interesting there is a vignette on, on the principle of vertical equity. I think it explained very well in a very short uh, half page uh, what are the consequences. So it's not only a matter of, of uh, numbers in absolute numbers. And I think we need to use all this information uh, to show um, also that there are potential solutions. No? So there are yeah. ways of integrating mental health in general health care in primary health care, in other programs, the training of non-specialists and always ensuring ongoing supervision that is very well highlighted, uh, the access to quality medicines. So it's, uh, okay, there is a problem, you need to prioritize and you need to invest. No? So I think that this is one of the key messages to, to use this information. And then um, I would say again, eh, that for emergencies is, since the beginning when we are thinking of, okay, how you prepare to an emergency and then MHPSS needs to be part of that and needs to be well budgeted and designed you know, as the activities. And then of course, all the advocate, advocacy towards the, the rights of people with uh, uh, living uh, uh, with, uh, with a mental health condition. It's really um, something that we see among health professionals, but also among the communities. Uh, 
uh, where we work and, and this is something that we need to also uh, use to, to fight the stigma and to promote the, their rights. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would say that this is our uh, key messages and uh, to finish is to promote this uh, approach no, of the rights-based, yeah. person-centered and uh, recovery-oriented approach. So. Decreasing yes. symptoms, improving functionality is essential, uh, but it's not enough. No? So we need to go beyond that and we need to aim for uh, full recovery of, uh, of the people. Very much so. Thank you, Christina. And in a, for the audience listening in, um, in a few minutes, we will open this for Q&A. So if you have a question, um, do kindly put it in the chat as uh, you also see Sarah's message of it. I turn to you quickly, Raj, because um, we have heard a, quite a bit about what is the support that WHO can give and how we can engage with them. Specifically for the LGBTQI plus community, what would you say is the most helpful in terms of the support that is needed? So I think... Um, thanks. I think before we get into supports, it's important mm -hmm. to say that there's a violent history and legacy of psychiatry with LGBTQIA persons. And if mm -hmm. we trace this history, the pathologization uh, in mental health systems and that collusion with social norms to uphold violence against LGBTQIA persons is very important. Uh, now, conversion practices are still happening. Institutionalized violence is still happening. So first we need to systemically counter this legacy and we in mental health must be informed by and center the needs of queer trans folks and this implicit bias and inequity that has been built in to mental health needs to be dismantled in approach, curricula and practice. So I'm going to keep it short and say there are resources out there to do this. So what's stopping us? Meg John Barker writes about this in the UK and here, Closer Home in South Asia, MHI has published a book on queer affirmative practice by queer trans mental health practitioners. It's free for download. We'll put the link in. And finally, I want to say that it doesn't extend to just our practice. We must look at this and go beyond the therapy room and create networks of allied services, mm. practitioners, and transform our education systems as well. Thanks. Thank you, Raj. Um, as we wait for some of the questions to come in, Defora, if I can ask you, you've heard quite a bit from our speakers as well from their perspectives in working with the WHO. From your chair, you know, what is your advice on how different stakeholders can unite and make use of this report to see the practical change that we talk about? Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, two uh, preliminary comments. One is very nice all uh, uh, participants, uh, your comments and, and the enthusiasm around the report and um, we appreciate that feedback. And the second comment is that I hardly will have anything to what has been said because a lot of what can be done uh, has already been said. From our perspective, and if we look at the situation globally, then a bit what I said earlier, we believe that the transformation must happen. And in order for that transformation to happen, we need the individual uh, commitment, understanding and valuing uh, mental health. We need uh, care providers and families recognizing and respecting mental health issues, uh, the, the different sectors at community and government level to promote and act the needed change. And then NGOs and academia to continue and increase the, the, the advocacy, the research, but also the interventions. And then the health sector, of course, that has a key role to play. So what we believe is that each country or each reality um, at the level that is feasible will um, perhaps look at the report and uh, feel inspired and uh, to, to then prioritize the actions that are more relevant according to their uh, current opportunities, capacities, resources, context, and then get mm. together with all these different actors and all of us as stakeholders to understand what it is that each one of us, what, what can we do from our role and our perspective to contribute and support a common goal for transformation? Because unless we get to this point of pushing together into the same direction, each one of us doing our piece, uh, otherwise things may not happen and we will continue um, with isolated uh, uh, good interventions, but not perhaps with a significant move that is what we need 
so that mm. each country can uh, make progress towards a better uh, mental health for, for its population. Yes, thank you, Devora. Prioritization in CLE indeed very important if we're to achieve our goals. And, and this actually links to a question we're getting in from our audience and from Sofin at the Sid Zurich Foundation. And maybe this pertains to some of the work that any of our speakers are doing here. So feel free to pick up on this question. And the question is asking about how prevention and promotion work is also identified as key approaches in your work. Like, and in some ways, how do you prioritize between the two? Um, would any of the speakers like to pick up on this? If I may. Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> go, go, Christina. <laughs> Okay, so uh, very briefly for us, it's, I mean, it's not about of choosing one or the other. So it's, uh, I think it's very well expressed also here. It's key part of the intervention, as important as treatment is promotion and prevention. And in emergencies is crucial because there are a lot, everyone is suffering, but not everyone is having already severe uh, no symptoms, problems, needs in mental health. So for us, it's a matter of really, it's, it's a, I think it's a very important question for us to highlight that promotion and prevention is a crucial uh, part of, of the response, at least in emergencies, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, Angie, I saw you unmuted. Did you have something to comment on? Yeah, so um, that's, that's, I think Christina already said that, but prevention is one of the key things that we're all working towards because we want to prevent every aspect. That's why we have tried, and that's why the report is clearly saying that we should have others that are not in a health space to join us this time around so that we can all work to prevent it from happening because when it happens to the rich, when it reach the point of treatment where we have to look look up for psychotropic medications, where we have to look for all our intervention is very expensive. So for us in Liberia here and other countries, we have the involved mostly in um, the, the media aspects and we also promote person with late experience in, in um, speaking out, giving their experiences so that the community, the family members will help us to prevent the cases from happening. So that's one of the key aspects. It's very important question that the audience have asked. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Um, we saw another question come in, and perhaps this one is directed to you, Ahmad, about the Afghanistan children. Um, and maybe if you can comment on what might be the mental health needs of Afghan children, and particularly perhaps in emergency settings, would you have something? Would you be able to answer that, Ahmad? Yes, um, I think, as we know that mental health itself is a complex paradigm and there are multiple social aspects that contribute to it. And the same way when the question of children are arised, it isn't only one aspect that they are getting affected. It's a matter of their education. It's a matter of poverty. It's a matter of how domestic abuse is posing um, a lot of burden onto their mental health. So when we speak about domestic abuse, mostly this stems from poverty inside um, their lives because most of the children in Afghanistan have to dig in streets. And so it prompts them to sexual abuse. And when they go back to home, they're asked about the amount of money that they have collected. And so if there isn't anything collected, they will be beaten severely or they will be deprived of eating, so they might suffer hunger, they might miss out or perform poorly in schools, they might miss out their schools and uh, class sessions. And as we, you know, as we comprehend how severe the condition might be in humanitarian crisis, some children might even migrate to another country um, or they might go from one province to another province just to, just for work. And seeing the complications of how, for example, in the road they might get sexually abused or how they might be bribed or trafficked even. Uh, there are a lot of complications that they have to face. And unfortunately, uh, the resources that we currently have in the understanding of mental health scenario is, you know, it's, it's largely missing. And just as we might know that in humanitarian settings, a lot of the attention goes towards um, conflict resolution. And so there's yes. less room left for thinking about mental health services, which needs yeah. to be stressed, but unfortunately there aren't any efforts being put um, until now. And I hope that we can do, we can come up with early intervention in schools and outside school settings um, in order to alleviate the violence and, and mental conditions that they are undergoing. 
Indeed, thank you, Ahmad. Um, and before we round up the conversation, yes, actually, I wanted to direct this to you, Devora, if you wanted to add any comments as well, because I'm sure the report addresses children as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, 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 indeed, what I wanted to mention is that uh, there is an entire chapter of the report dedica dedicated to promotion and prevention. And then, uh, you know, over time, I'm sure we all witnessed a lot of initiatives that were supposedly to promote and prevent mental health, but were not based on, on scientific evidence. So maybe a lot of resources wasted some time uh, just uh, issuing um, uh, statements or programs that do not necessarily have the evidence to make an impact. Well, what we try to do in this uh, chapter is to collect as much uh, information as possible uh, to uh, link with examples and programs that have been uh, shown that are uh, producing good results in the field of promotion and uh, in the field of prevention. Specifically, then we prioritize three areas for prevention. One is suicide prevention, and then there is the continuation of this chat will focus on suicide, one aspect of suicide prevention. And then the other one is children and adolescents. And then uh, the, the, the third one is the work in the workplace. In each one of these areas, we uh, list and, and, and suggest uh, what are the issues that need to be prioritized under each in order to make meaningful changes, whether it is for the policy or and then the, the concrete action that could take place in this case, as Ahmad was saying, uh, 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 with children specifically uh, at school or out of school, not every kid in the world goes to school and that's something that needs to be always keep in mind uh, working on school is not the only option for children right and and yes. uh, and then yes i suggest that you uh, have a look at the at the, the colleagues that uh, are the, uh, requested this uh, that made this question to have a look at the report and and my last comment on the report is that the link was uh, uploaded here in the chat a couple of times. There is, we, for the time being, we translated only the executive summary in the six uh, official UN languages. Yes. And then hopefully in the coming month, we will have uh, full versions in, the, in those official uh, languages. So keep tuned. <laughs> Thank you. Watch the space indeed. Um, I know we have another question coming in, but we don't, have, unfortunately, don't have time to answer it. So I invite our panelists to maybe stick around and can answer answer the question in the chat about how individuals can raise mental health awareness and indeed I think some of us have touched on the points and most importantly is not to wait um, if you want to do something do it and so as a roundup if I invite each of you to complete this tweet for us um, use the WHO mental health report to transform mental health by shall I start with you Raj sure um, <clears throat> I think use the WHO report to say that we cannot sidestep the need to address social, economic and institutional exclusion that contributes to psychosocial distress, to widen our ambit beyond affirmative mental health policy and services to demand freedom from violence, from food insecurity, to provision of social safety nets, labor rights, LGBTQI rights and human rights. Thank you, Raj. Christina. Yeah, by integrating MHPSS in all emergencies since the preparedness until the recovery phase. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. How about for you, Ahmad? I would say use the World Health Organization's mental health report to transform mental health by placing it at the forefront of our development and humanitarian agenda and return for decent growth in our economy, social well-being and sustainable development so that the cycle of inequality must break. Thank you, Ahmad. Angie. Yes, okay, I will say use the WHO um, transformation mental, in mental health document to um, use it as a tool when you are revising your document, when you are developing policy, whatever document you say as a tool, and for us in Liberia, that's a very good start for us. And we are so happy that this document at the start that we have in the process of reviewing our policy is going to be used to inform every aspect, especially looking at the area when it comes to uh, coordination with all our sector and to enhance advocacy. So use this tool to for um, WHO to use this tool to, to present at 
uh, government or whatever. We want the issue to use it to, pre to present Thank at you. country offices. So whatever the uh, program or conferences, let it be widely spread. Let the presentation, the discussion of this document continue maybe the next one to two years so that everyone can understand what is it like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Welcome. Angie. In the last 15 seconds, Devora, last but not please, how would you suggest we use this report? Of course, we have to read it. And what well, else? I read it. Uh, on top of all that was said, let's make sure that the title becomes a reality. Let's use it to make it a reality, transforming mental health for all. Thank you. Let's do what we can to transform the parts of mental health that we can in our society. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. Thank you to all our guest speakers for sharing their experience and advice. The notes and the recording will be posted shortly. And as some of you have noted already, the next webinar in the Global Mental Health Action Network annual meeting series is on developing national suicide prevention strategies. And that will start in 30 minutes. And you can find the link to register for that chat for that webinar in the chat. Again, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Take care. Thank you. Also, thank, you. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.